Thank you very much. Um, so I'll be sharing some work today that's conducted by myself, as well as David Farnham and Ken Caldera, also at Carnegie Science, and Nathan Lewis from Caltech. And I'd like to start just by saying we had some great energy system modeling talks yesterday, yesterday by Professor Sally Benson, Professor Hans Auer, Professor Destiny Nock, and Professor Lei Shi. And it's gonna be great to follow up um, behind them on that and it'll, it'll be a good challenge. And I wanna say that I'm gonna be taking this talk, uh, we're gonna be asking different types of questions than what, than what they were asking about low carbon energy systems. So in this talk, we're gonna be incorporating multiple years of weather data into models of deeply decarbonized electricity systems to learn how systems can be improved with more years of, of data. And in the same way that engineers design structures to withstand once in a century or even once in a millennium floods, we wanna ask uh, what do we need to do to think about um, energy systems, deeply decarbonized energy systems that can withstand uh, once very, very infrequent and severe wind droughts or, or solar droughts, um, as, as, well as, as well as other things such as uh, heat waves or cold snaps. So with that, um, let's, let's get going. There, incorporating wind and solar into energy systems is clearly an, an emerging challenge. There's variability on many time scales from sub-hourly to daily, seasonally, and, and even annually. In this figure, what you're seeing is, um, is, is, is based on, on 36 years of weather records in the United States. This is showing you how, how much wind or solar power you could have been producing um, across the aggregate United States over these 36 years. And, and this is, um, th these are daily average values. So the darker line that you see for wind and solar, those are the median of, of each of the 36 years of data for every day going along. And the, the darker shaded is the interquartile with the, with the lighter shading show you the minimum and maximum values for um, the days across there. So clearly the variability is going to be a, a substantial challenge to, um, to be able to make systems that can withstand this. We are, are far from the first people um, that are asking these questions. I think a great, a great quote from a, a recent paper, um, Zeringer et al. says, power system design is highly sensitive to the interannual variability of weather and planning based on a single year can lead to operational ina inadequacy and failure to meet long-term decarbonization objectives. And on the, on the right-hand side, you're seeing a figure from their paper where you can see the, the years of data on the x-axis and when they run their model and, uh, and um, are returned to some uh, built capacities in their model, you can see how, how variable it is from year to year. So you have flexible generation on the top row, you have storage capacity on the middle row and transmission on the bottom. And uh, specifically, they're showing two different, two different decarbonization scenarios. But the main takeaway is that these capacities vary from, from year to year. With that in mind, we're asking the question, how many years of data is enough? So we're interested in how models of idealized least cost electricity systems vary depending on the number of years of resource and demand data incorporated into the model. And um, from exploring that, we're interested in what potential uh, implications are or takeaway messages could be for, for system planners. Uh, just as, as, a, as a little thought experiment, I'm going to come back to a couple of times. Imagine you only had two years of input data for your model and your model um, and one year has a substantial solar drought in it. Well, if you're going to optimize your model on just that to deliver power to your system, you're going to be building probably a more wind heavy model. And if your other year has a wind drought in it, you'll probably, you'll probably end up building a more solar heavy model. So, but if you can optimize both of those years simultaneously, you're going to build a system that is robust against um, both types of, of droughts, wind and solar droughts. So probably be a more expensive system with larger capacities, but it will also be able to withstand future years or other types of variability that we will likely see in our weather records going forwards. So we ask, um, so we ask specifically, how do system costs and asset capacities change based on the number of years of data incorporated into a model? And can we identify critical years 
with substantial leverage in determining these asset capacities. Also, how does the performance of model systems improve uh, when we incorporate these extra years of data? And we're going to test and we're going to have some tests of that at the very end. All right, and uh, this is just a, a really simple schematic of our, of our model. Um, I'd like to thank Sally Benson for introducing macro scale energy modeling yesterday. Um, she, she did a great job of, of introducing that and motivating models that don't have all of the grid details that, that you might have in like a power flow model. So we, we are dealing with a model where, um, that, that strips away a lot, of, a lot of details that you might find in others. And this allows us to run more years of data. And we, we represent three different generation types, wind, solar, as well as a, a firm power, uh, a firm power type. And specifically we're using natural gas with carbon capture and storage, but this could, we could switch to um, nuclear or some other type of low, low carbon um, technology as well, if we were interested. And the model results would not change substantially. We also have battery energy storage, and this model could be extended in other directions with like long duration energy storage, but that actually was limiting the, the amount of years of data that we could run. So we're, we're starting here and we can get a lot of the, the takeaway messages from this. So with these, these four different assets are modeled with um, fixed and variable costs, and those are based on EIA current costs. We don't have any, we're not doing a capacity expansion model where we're taking time steps throughout um, throughout decades. We're just modeling one fixed final snapshot of what a system could look like. And we have hourly wind and solar capacity factor time series. These are, these are based on historical weather data and um, across the, the continental United States and, and other regions. And then we have hourly electricity load data we're gonna use a combination of historical data and we'll actually step to using some synthetic data. I'm sorry, somebody is throwing bags of trash into a truck. I hope that's not too loud. Um, and just to say, we're starting by, by modeling historical um, situations. This is a great place to begin to learn about what, are, what could happen in the future, but we do know that with changing climate that, uh, that we could be in store for there could be other um, surprises in store for us. So but let's start with just getting a grip on the historical data. Additionally, we can provide some constraints on the firm power uh, dispatch to model like different degrees of decarbonization in the model. And the model ends up optimizing the installed capacities of these four different technologies, as well as the, the dispatch, um, the hourly dispatch of them. And with the goal to minimize system costs and deliver 100% of the electricity for the load. With that, let's, let's start into the, the first question. How do system costs and asset capacities change based on the number of years of data incorporated into a model? And let's, and I'm gonna start with just a very, um, a very basic system in our model, a system that is 100% powered by, by firm generation. And if we have a least cost model and one year of data, you're gonna be building a system that can supply exactly your peak uh, electricity demand. But if you have, um, but then if you have more years of data records, uh, in this case, we're going to be dealing with 17 years of historical ERCOT. Um, ERCOT is the uh, the energy system organizer in Texas. Uh, if you have 17 years of data, you have 17 possible maximum capacities that, that you would be building in your system. And depending on what years are incorporated into your model, you'll have you'll be building to a different um, threshold. Uh, you can see the, the original historical data that we have on the left. There's clearly some, uh, some growth in here from likely economic factors or population growth, just to make these years more comparable year to year to year so that we're really focusing on the variability. We, we detrend this with just a simple exponential fit. And let's see, let's see if I can move this, okay. And with, with that, let's step to looking at some initial, initial results showing the, uh, the firm generation capacity on the y-axis. And the x-axis is showing the number of years incorporated into each of our energy system models. So if we look at the, the value of one down here, I said we had 17 years of, of historical data here. So all the values associated with x equals one, we have, we have an ensemble 
of 17 simulations providing the, the data in this column. And then as we step out, we're including more years. So for the value of three, we're selecting three years at random from our 17 year data set. Um, so we, we're running over a large combination of possibilities. Now, this is a huge combinatorical problem. This could get very out of hand <laughs> quick. So we, we limit ourselves to just taking the first 200 combinations when we're going, once we get beyond one. And, and what you see, and I'm showing a number of different uh, statistical or data indicators um, in these figures. Perhaps it's a little bit too much, and maybe I erred on the side of too many lines, and I'm sorry. Uh, but we're showing the median value for these ensemble of results, the mean values, as well as the uh, interquartile range, and the minimum and maximum values that are returned from our um, ensemble of results. And as you could as you could likely imagine, when you add more years of data into this, this very simple system, you are on average increasing the capacity of firm generation that you build. Um, and, and very importantly, the, this, this minimum installed capacity line is going, up, is going up pretty quickly as you go to more and more years of generation. Now let's get uh, closer towards a, a system that, that we're interested in that incorporates wind, solar, as well as battery storage. I'm leaving firm generation off for the moment just to really highlight the impacts of weather variability, but we'll, we'll, pull, that in, um, we'll pull that in a little bit later. So we're gonna call this the wind solar battery system. And this first figure I'm, I'm showing you is the, uh, the system cost. So this is like the levelized cost of, um, of supplied electricity in the model. And one thing you'll, you'll note is that the number of years incorporated into my model is no longer 15, like on that previous slide, which could have gone even further, but is limited to five. This is just due to computational constraints. Adding the battery in, in our, in our least cost optimization model really, uh, really limits the amount of years that we could have. But um, with that, we can still go out to five and we can learn quite a bit. And Oh, and, and as you as we would expect, the, the system costs are, are, are trending upwards. And if we return to that, that simple thought experiment with the one year with the solar drought, one year with the wind drought, if you bring both of them into a single year, you're going to build larger capacities um, in general and with slightly higher system costs, as we would expect. Now let's look at the, the asset capacities quickly. And the, and we're showing the wind nameplate capacity on the left, solar nameplate capacity in the middle, and storage nameplate power capacity on the right. And, and if we look at the, or first, these are the nameplate power capacities. So in these data records um, for ERCOT, the, the wind capacity factor is roughly 40% with solar closer to 30%. So if you wanted to try to convert those into, um, um, away from nameplate into actual produced energy, you could do that. And these are shown as a percent of the mean electricity demand um, for each year. And one thing you'll notice is that the solar capacity and storage are increasing with the number of years incorporated, but, and this, this surprised us originally, the, the wind capacity is actually decreasing as we add more and more years into our model. And one thing that, that helped, uh, helped hint to us to what might be going on is that you see that there are some years with next to zero wind capacity that's installed. So our, our little operating hypothesis here was that there were a few years with severe wind droughts. And when you sample more years of data or when you sample a wind drought year, you're gonna build very little wind capacity because you need so much solar and storage to make it through. And as you increase the number of years that you sample in your model, you have a higher chance of sampling a wind drought year. So just with that in mind, let's, let's take a step towards question two and we can, can we identify critical years with substantial leverage in determining asset capacities? And here, I'm, we're gonna be, I'm gonna be showing a number of these box and whisker plots where we break out the results of the years individually along the x-axis. And, and what I'm showing, for example, for the column uh, 2009, uh, 2009 includes the results from all models that incorporated the year 2009 in it. So this shows you kind of how much leverage each year has over the system costs, or I'll show asset capacities in just a second. And specifically, I'm showing the cases where we're only simulating two years simultaneously. So you get 
the year that's shown as well as, as well as another year. And one year really jumps out at us. The, the year 2015 has um, very high system costs and the, the spread is very little and compared to all the others, which are closer, uh, more down here. And uh, it, well, people will note that these are very high electricity costs. This again is without the, the firm generation added in. This is just uh, an illustrative picture. Now, if we take a look at the asset capacities as well, we have system costs up here, solar capacity upper right, wind lower left, and storage lower right. You see that year 2015 is completely an outlier in all of these cases where the solar capacity is high, wind capacity is next to zero in all of the, the results, and storage capacity is very high, where the, the spread in the other years are not nearly as, as large or as high. With that in mind, we wanted to think a little bit about the wind and solar droughts that could be could be driving these these results, and and I want to take we took some methods from a recent paper. Um, a number of people have been working on this, where we're we're defining a drought day as a day that where the production in wind or solar is a certain um, threshold below the seasonal expectation. And you can, you can change that depending on what kind of severity of drought you want to be analyzing. Uh, we just started with a 50% production below the seasonal expectation. And when you do that, you can look at how long your wind or solar droughts are for your region over your data record. And this is over the 17 years of historical data. And we see that there are quite, in ERCOT, there are quite a few days with um, single, with single day long uh, wind droughts at this severity. And there are a declining number of two to three day droughts. And this goes down and there, there is um, a week, a week or longer drought here. Solar, the droughts are not as intense at this severity. But we really wanted to know not just the occurrences here, but we wanted to know the occurrence of the, the ones that were really driving our results. So we looked, we looked at the results from this year, 2015, and we saw that there were two days worth of, um, worth of data in, our, in the result file that were, really had incredible leverage over the built capacities. And these two days had wind production that was more than 90% below your seasonal expectation. And just for, just for discussion, we labeled those as severe drought days. And you can see that the year 2015 is the only year that has a two to three um, day long severe wind drought, as well as it also has more single day long severe wind droughts compared to the other years. I'm only showing years that actually had even a single record in here and all the other ones just have one. Okay, and with that, with that in mind, we're, we're kind of interested in, in two, two additional steps here. We want to um, model more years of data simultaneously to see if our trends continue in the same way that we originally saw with five years. And we also wanna to go to more years of data. We're not looking for once in 17 year events to really define our system. We wanna we want push the envelope here and go as far as we can. So the first, the first step we took was to decrease our model resolution. And that's, that's not something that you normally hear when people are talking about modeling deeply decarbonized systems, but, um, but that's a step that we're taking here. And let me just show you some figures that show that at least in our idealized model, where we're trying to learn about general system behaviors and characteristics, this appears to be giving us some, um, some useful information or we can learn something here. You can compare the results from one year or five years of data in the, in the blue, where you can compare the mean and the median values here and here. And you're seeing that they're, they're not exactly on top of the, the one hour results. We wouldn't expect the one hour, four hour to be identical, but they do track very similarly. And like storage, for example, there is, there is more value to having storage when you have one hour resolution. You're gonna have more little variations that you're gonna be smoothing out. That'll lead to more value of that and more capacity in your system. But overall, the results are quite similar. So we say, that at least to learn something initially, four hours is going to be okay. Now we want to 
step to using longer, longer data records. And with that, we have to step away from our historical ERCOT demand and start using some synthetic demand. We're going to be basing this on historical data, but uh, we take some methods from Waite and Modi where they, um, just using hour, hourly temperature alone, they reconstruct electricity demand profiles and that they do this down to the, the county level across the United States. So with that, we're able to, um, to extend our demand record. And we just wanted to provide a little comparison of the historical demand data versus the synthetic demand data to, to make sure people think that this is an okay thing and that we could be learning something. You're seeing that our, all of our trends are very similar for the, the wind and solar. Storage is um, displaced upwards a little bit. We are, we are resulting in different demand profiles where these synthetic demand profiles have a little bit, a little bit more um, aggressive peaks and troughs giving solar slightly more value, and that translates to higher system costs. One thing to note here is that while I said the, we're sampling uh, 200 um, different systems at random for each one of these ensemble, ensembles, we do start with the same um, random, random, we do start with the same seed. So that's why you see the, these, these lines being very, very similar, is that we are sampling the same exact years when we do this comparison. And with that, we can now extend to all 40 years. We're using the, the MIRA2 reanalysis data set. And we're actually looking forward to extending this to ERA5 where we'll get 70 years of data, but this is where we are at the moment. And one thing that really jumps out to you here is that this wind, the wind trajectory really changes. No longer do we have this downward decline, but we have, have a much more flat, um, much more flat uh, installed capacities as we add years. This shows you kind of the importance of the, of the data records that, that you're looking at. If you're looking at just a few years of data, you could end up with a significant outlier that really skews all the results. And really, if we added, if we went to 70 years, I don't know exactly how, um, how these results would change. If you added, if there were a bunch of severe wind droughts in those extra 30 years, this could, this could change a little bit. But now let's, let's focus in on some of those outlier um, years because that, that can teach us something about what we need to build our systems to withstand. And looking at the system costs, these are again those box plots where we show the years on the x-axis. There were three years that really stood out as extreme in system costs, 1983, 1989, and 2015. And if we look at the asset capacities, the, the solar installation is the highest for 2015. These other years are not, are, this one is extreme, but not as extreme. When we go to wind capacity, we see that 83 and 2015 have close to zero installed wind. And when we look at storage capacity, 1989 is the incredible outlier here. And to bring this back to those, a discussion of drought days, I'm showing you the amount the, the percent of the, the, the electricity production on those days compared to their seasonal expe expected value. So in, in 83, it was a severe wind drought where you only produced 7% of your seasonal expected energy and solar was pretty nominal, but the demand that day was, was very high. This, this was a very cold day that really pushed electric heating high in the demand in ERCOT or with the synthetic data, that's what, what we would estimate. In 89, we have some, uh, a severe drought day with a normal wind drought day and solar is pretty nominal and fairly high demand. And then we have our 2015 occurrence where the wind is incredibly low for two days in a row, as well as coupled with a solar drought. So I'm just gonna step to a mini summary here for this wind solar battery system. So for a 100% reliable wind solar battery system, the least cost system can be essentially determined by one or a few weather events that have incredible leverage over the, over the model. Years with these critical weather events can be identified in multiple ways from outliers in, the, in our system cost or capacities, from drought and analyses, and probably a number of other ways as well. And with that in mind, let's take a step to adding a little bit more flexibility into our system and model something that is closer to what we would expect in, a, in decarbonized systems. You could do this in a number of different ways and we will likely do this as a combination of all of these, 
but we're just gonna start by adding clean firm power into our model. And to kind of dial in a, a decarbonization threshold, we just stated that the clean, the um, natural gas with carbon capture and storage can supply 5% of the annual electricity load. Uh, the CCS is not 100% efficient here. So this is giving us close to a decarbonized system, but not, but not perfectly. And one thing, and the, the big thing that you originally noticed is that the spread in these ensemble of values is much smaller as soon as we add in a firm generation resource. The, the system costs go up, the system costs go up slightly as we add more years of data and increase, thus increasing the variability and building a system that can withstand 20 years of variability. The, the wind capacities are fairly stable, maybe decline a tiny bit. Solar is pretty flat. The, um, the spread in the ensemble decreases as you go further out. Wind and solar are providing the bulk of the energy in this system, but they're not, the capacities are not increasing. They're not being expanded upon to provide the reliability as we add more years of data. That is provided a little bit by storage, which expands a bit, but it's really provided by this firm generation where you see the capacities going from mean and median values of about 100% of mean demand up towards um, 140 or 150% of the mean demand. And why is that? Well, if we go back and look at these, at these box plots again, we see that two out of our three, um, two, two out of three of these extreme years that we identified previously require or require in, in least cost systems, they have incredible amounts of firm generation installed. And, very likely that's to deal with the fact that you're coupling wind droughts with demand spikes in, the, in your winter months. And we can look at the other capacities such as solar. These years are no longer as much of outliers, a little bit there for 2015. And wind and storage, these years are a little bit elevated. But with the addition of clean firm power, the, the outliers in, your, in these three technologies are less extreme and the firm generation really provides the, the reliability in your system. Now I'm just gonna take a quick step to show some results from France. I advertised that in the abstract. Um, I just wanna show everyone that Urkati is by no means the only region that's gonna be dealing with wind and solar droughts. Other regions will be having years that pull the results in one way or another. If we look at 10 years of data from France and build models based on those, 2010 and 2016 were both resulted in very, very low installed wind or lower installed wind capacity compared to all the other years for a wind solar battery system. And once we went to including firm power, year 2010 had about 20% more firm power. So these kind of ideas were, were, could be applicable in, in all regions. With that in mind, let's take a step towards that, that third question. How does the performance of modeled systems improve when incorporating more years of data? And to answer that, we're going to test our systems on out of sample data. So remember we have this large ensemble of results over, over a thousand um, simulations per, per scenario. And for each of those, we're gonna be testing it on years that were not included in the original optimization to see how it performs. And this could be a proxy for other years in the future um, to check that performance. And our metric of reliability is going to be lost load for the unsupplied electricity demand. And on the left-hand side, you'll see the wind solar battery system for ERCOT and the right-hand side includes, the, includes firm power. And we're showing the maximum lost load the 90th percentile, the 75th percentile, as well as the median value. And one thing you notice right away is that stepping from one year to two years to three years of data incorporated into your model really drives down these, these initial lost load values. Uh, what you're really doing here is you are making sure that your model is not built exclusively on an easy year of data, a year that, that doesn't have a, a drought that's hard to supply. So just incorporating a little bit of extra variability can really, can really pushes that down. We also see that 
that these values are not going to zero as quick as one, as one might hope. So it's striving to produce a 100% long-term reliable system without some form of a reserve margin will be difficult. I don't think anyone ever suggested that, but um, reserve margins have been a thing in the electricity um, systems for decades and will probably continue to be a good, a good idea. Uh, reserve margins, for those that aren't familiar with it, um, it's building the system to supply your peak, your forecasted peak demand, plus another 15 or so percent on top of that. And the nice thing from, from this is that when we start thinking about reserve margins or something, some, some safety margin, we, we now see which technologies are the kind of reliable portion of our energy systems. In the wind solar battery system, it was solar and storage, which had more, whose asset capacities were increasing as we added years to our data records. Those, that indicates that those are the um, technologies that are expanded when you want reliability in that type of system. When you add firm power in, you really want to, um, to double down on your firm generation because that's where you're getting your reliability from. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap this up with a little summary that incorporating more years of data into electricity system optimization models on average increases system costs, increases the system reliability, and it can yield interesting trade-offs where certain technology capacities are expanded while others remain approximately constant or even slightly decline. And with these methods, we were able to identify which technologies provide the reliable portion of a reliable electricity system in these simplified models. And I'm not expecting anyone to go and try to run 20 years of data in very, very complicated models that do a, a better job of describing the actual electricity grid and distribution system than we do. But perhaps these methods could be used to identify outlier years for other optimization models and for optimization as well as testing of those models. And this could possibly help um, other systems improve their performance without increasing the length of their, of their data records. And with that, this, I didn't exactly answer the question of how many years of data is enough. We don't, we don't have a firm number of years, but we do have the idea that there really are these potential outlier years that will have large leverage and weight on your system that could be great to incorporate when you're optimizing the model, but could also be good years for testing the performance of your model. And with that, I'd like to, I'd like to say thank you to the symposium conveners, participants for making this interesting and engaging, and as well as to our energy system modeling team at Carnegie Science, Caltech, and UC Irvine. And this work was supported by a generous gift from Gates Ventures. With that, I would love to take any questions or comments and open it up. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Tyler. Uh, very interesting uh, talk on, on topics uh, cl close to my own area of research. Should we have time for a few questions? Please uh, ask your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and maybe I can start with, with, uh, with one question, Tyler. So, so you're looking primarily at historical data um, when, when you are doing this uh, capacity planning exercise. So, uh, but we also know that uh, the historical weather is not necessarily reflective of future weather given climate change, right? Um, Absolutely. So, so you, you mentioned synthetic data, but could you elaborate a bit more on how you see, you know, using historical data uh, is sufficient for future, for future planning? Well, well, this, this was just to begin to give us ideas of, of where we would want to focus. Um, I think some of our next steps could be looking at uh, techniques for generating synthetic wind and solar capacity factor series going forward, as well as, as, well as demand. Demand is one that we clearly know is going to be changing a lot as we, as we electrify. So there, there are factors that could be changing all three of these um, profiles. And and uh, I guess the, the, some of the first steps would just be to see if, if results really, really vary. I mean, in the end, in the end, this is an idealized model that's not, like, no one should take the results here and try to build an energy system that matches these capacities and say that this will work in ERCOT. This is to show us how, um, well, where we would want to be thinking to expand capacities or what type of behaviors we would be expecting in a long-term reliable system. And 
uh, other more detailed models should probably be tuning in and dialing in the exact the exact results. So I, I think I think we could be if we do have more and more extreme events, we might see uh, a quicker rise in the in the trajectory, say, of the, the firm generation as it becomes more and more valuable more quickly. Um, but but it'll be it'll be interesting to see how it changes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I'll looking at uh, the list of questions here. There's one question about um, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, could you say something more about the system models you mentioned in your speech? Uh, could you give us some examples of what kind of models you have tested? Um, um, well. I guess I, I need to ask a little bit, a little bit more about uh, what kind of models they're asking about. This this model is is actually as simple as what I was showing on the, in that schematic. There really are four kind of asset capacities. We are not trying to model individual generators or anything at that kind of resolution. We have one bulk wind capacity that represents the amount of installed wind, and our wind uh, our wind resource profile is spread across. Texas in the 25% of the region with the best, uh, with the most generation. So it, it's kind of a, a spread, a, a spread out model in that, in that way. Um, Maybe I can add added uh, detail on the modeling side. So, so you mentioned uh, reserve margins. Is, is that something you impose in your model? Uh, I'm curious, you know, no. to what extent can you capture these effects by imposing a and, and plan for a robust system if you impose a, a constraint on, on capacity? So that, and that's actually exactly one of the next steps that we want to take in this analysis. This, these models are optimizing to produce the least cost model that supplies 100% of the electricity. But then what our, our next step would be is when we go to that testing phase, when we go to um, test the, the lost load against other years of data, what, what I would envision doing is I would say, okay, wind and solar capacities are held fixed when we test it but let's add 10% to our optimal firm generation capacity. And then you could test and you could see how your loss load changes. And that would it'll increase your system costs certainly, but it will, it will drop those, those um, lost load values much more quickly. And then you could start to see uh, when you go to zero and how quickly you go to zero. So that'll be, that'll be an idea on how to test the degree of reserve margin that, that could likely be um, reasonable and which technologies that would be most cost-effective on. Great, thank you. I, I wanna I give an opportunity to other panelists in case, in case there are other questions uh, from the panelists. Um, if, if not, uh, actually I wanna ask one, one last question from my end. So you, you talked about, uh, you looked at ERCOT and Texas, but uh, have you looked at the ERCOT event, uh, the crisis back in February uh, and any insights or, or comments you can share on, on that specific event? Um, I, I, I wish I could say that we, that we had modeled that. Um, we, have not, we have not stepped uh, into looking at that data just yet, but I think that, I think that some of those uh, in this, in this model, we are relying on the, the generation technologies being available. So when we model wind, wind generation, we're, we're talking about systems that are producing according to the how, how much the wind is blowing. So we are modeling like weatherized wind turbines. When we're talking about natural gas generation, we're talking about generation that can, can turn on when you, when you call it. So that'd be weatherized um, natural gas systems. So this is kind of providing like the the, the best case scenario, if, if you will. So if you, for, if you don't include weatherization in your, in your system, you're going, to be, you're going to need to expand those capacities. After all, we saw that the three, these three really critical years that we found here, those were all winter events, two of them in December and one in January. So I think that really highlights that, that going forward that <laughs> there's going to be some need to weatherize there. Thank you so much, Tyler. Very interesting presentation. Um, uh